and uh, I would like to welcome Eva Hessen back. You are currently working at the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at Karolinska Institute, don't you? Uh, actually, I have just started my clinical training, so I am working at Region Stockholm and the, the OCD, which is a child and adolescent okay. clinic for OCD, and they are sitting up there. Okay. <laughs> you have your colleagues here as well. Yeah. Nice. But my uh, my uh, affiliation, the university is Karolinska. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't remember who was talking to you earlier, that I, was it written maybe? I don't remember. Uh, anyway, your research is in clinical psychology and psychiatry, and you have recently published your, the first Swedish thesis, and probably, as somebody mentioned, the second one in the world. I don't know who said that. And you said it, I remember it right. I'm glad my brain is still functioning. Thank you, Dritten said it. The, the second, the, the, probably the second or the first in Sweden. Congratulations. Thank you. And I guess that you're going to talk about the results in your thesis, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, my name is Eva, and Susanne Beirut is my, has been my main supervisor, and we have worked together now for five years and so we've been very happy this uh, past few days to get to see each other again because now we're in different cities and in different places. Um, but I'm going to talk today about diagnosis and biomarkers of hands. Let's see. Okay, so these are the questions that we had when we started. We started in 2014. And then we've been collecting data and then writing up everything. And then the questions that we had were that on the one hand, it was very difficult to make the diagnosis in clinical practice. How do we do it? What instruments do we use? And that the treatment options available for pants and pandas are generally, and they are generally still very poorly examined. And that the pathophysiology, although there is a solid idea, I would say, well, unknown is a strong word, but it's not. Uh, proven and it's hard to know exactly how, how, how it all comes together. But on the other hand, patients with pants and pandas experience, experience that immunomodulatory treatments work. And there's a diagnostic test on the market for pants and pandas, a blood test. And then I also want to say that the immunopsychiatry paradigm as a whole is gaining ground all over in psychiatry. And we're learning more about the immune system, and we're learning more about how the immune system influ influences the brain. Uh, and all this knowledge also comes together in the pants and pandas field. Um, so I show this picture sometimes. I took this picture of a bush in Sri Lanka when I was there on a holiday because someone said, there's a snake in the bush, you should take a picture. And I took a picture, and then when I came home, I saw the snake, but I didn't actually maybe see it. Do you see the snake? Um, do you see it? It's in the middle. It's like in the middle of the picture. I show it just to say that for me, this is just, um, things can be very different, but they look very similar when you look at them in one, uh, um, when you look at them just in one instant, or we just think of something that's long and it's green, and then they can look to be very similar, but still they're so different. Um, and to me, it's the same thing in the field of hands and pandas. Like one of the main challenges is to identify which patient with OCD and severe symptoms will benefit from immunomodulatory treatment, and which patient will benefit from SSRIs and behavioral therapy. Uh, and that's what we have tried to look at. So the aims of my thesis, I'm just going to look at, I'm just going to tell you about two papers that we have published. One is a description of a Swedish cohort with suspected pants and pandas that we have met. And then the other is an evaluation of the diagnostic accuracy of this blood test that aims to diagnose pants and pandas. And then we have also written one paper of uh, reports on treatment from the families that we have met, and then a systematic review, but I'm not going to tell you about those today. But we try and publish everything open access, so everything is available 
uh, online. So Suzanne and I, we thought, we spent 2015 and 2016 traveling all around Sweden. And I don't have a driver's license, so, so I spent my PhD year sitting next to Suzanne when she drove me around Sweden to the homes of these patients. We met most of them at home, but we also met them at local clinics. Um, and we made psychiatric interviews. We used some standardized interviews, like the white box for OCD and uh, the mini for, uh, like, which is a general diet overview assessment that's very commonly used in Sweden. But we also made some assessments that were developed for this study and that have then been uh, developed into PNISI by, by Suzanne. Um, and then we tried to look at this with the symptoms and then also the onset and the course. Because when we started, we thought that it's OCD and then it's the ticks and then you have the two of the seven criteria. But all of, in the literature, there's always this onset and then the course, that it has to have an episodic course. What does that mean? How do we measure that? So we tried to look extra at the onset and the course. Also found it very hard to know, like, how do we in retrospect know what if the onset was within 72 hours? How do we measure that? It's a very difficult clinical question to answer. And we made a, we made a decision after meeting them for three to five hours. We also made them stand in rumber stands, and we also filmed them all. Uh, and, um, they did neuropsychological testing and we have taken some blood tests and uh, the whole assessment took between three and five hours. We met everyone at one time in the course of their disorder, but because of administrative reasons and also because of the severity of the symptoms, we had to meet some at two sittings, but we consider each, we consider each uh, assessment as having been done at one time of their, of their disorder, but we don't have like repetitive before and after treatment measures in this data set. Um, and after we met them, we made a decision. Does each patient meet full PANS for PANDAS criteria? We also use the identity uh, CANS, which is another entity that's been proposed. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then the general, so these are the people we met. We also met a psychiatric comparison group. Huh. These screens are so far away, usually like I don't to jump and point, but they, I can't now. <laughs> um, so we made a, a... Oh yeah, there's a pointer, right. Uh, oh, yeah, so we have a healthy comparison sample that we didn't assess so much. We asked them, are you healthy? Are you really, really healthy? Have you ever had any mental disorder? Have you ever had any um, autoimmune or rheumatology disorder? Uh, and then we have what we call the Cunningham panel sample, and that's um, we based the the idea was that we wanted to quickly find a sample that we could assess within the two years, and then we wanted to have, someone had to have suspected them to have pans and pandas, so that's why we used this blood test. So the Cunningham sample, uh, panel is a is a blood test that's uh, been developed by Molecular Labs in Oklahoma and USA. And uh, it's aim it aims to diagnose pants and pandas. So we thought that anyone who has taken the test, they must have suspected pants or pandas because a physician, a doctor needs to do the referral, and also the test is quite costly, and you have to fill in a paper form, so it's like it's a thing you have to do. So we thought that probably doctors would uh, order the test unless they thought it was pants and pandas. And the test is also called pandas panela in Swedish, which means the pandas panel. So that's how we try to get our like pans pandas enriched sample. So we invited everyone who had taken the test in Sweden. That was 154 people. Uh, 60 people answered in the invitation. 54 were 56. Does it say some were eligible? Uh, and uh, we met 53 in the end. Um, and then we have this classification. So we considered the ones that did not meet full pants or pants criteria. We call them the suspected pants group, since someone had suspected them of having pants. And then we have a confirmed pants group, which, we, which is a, like an interview confirmed pants group. According to our assessment, they met uh, full pants criteria. Then we have a psychiatric comparison sample, which
which is a general psychiatric group that's recruited in outpatient clinics in Örebro. Uh, and we've used them in order to see, okay, so what if, if we ask the same questions about onset and course to normal psychiatric patients with severe symptoms, do they also have an abrupt onset? If we ask the same questions, do they also say, yeah, this was sudden? Um, so, so that's why we use them. So in this talk, the pink, the pink groups. <laughs> I'm going to. They are they are the ones that are when I talk about the biomarkers, and then the blue groups is when we talk about uh, diagnosis and clinical features. So this is a paper that was published uh, this year, or uh, yeah, this year is where we describe the clinical features of these 53 patients and the 30-something um, psychiatric comparison group. Um, and so again, we met them at one time. It's basically a case control study. We compare these three groups. It's based on the interviews we made. And we describe the symptoms that they have. And then the focus is on acute onset and on the course of the disorder. Um, and these are the criteria that we use to classify. You've seen them before. They are the SWEDO 98 and the SWEDO 2012 criteria that you've seen before. Um, but then this episodic course, we thought, how shall we measure this? And then we looked at the MS literature, which also has episodic course. And uh, we found that they have these neat pictures. So uh, we asked everyone to choose one of the pictures. This was one way we tried to measure episodic course, but we didn't have a good way to do it. Um, I know some, with chart review it may be easier, and if you also follow a patient in the clinic it may be easier to classify them, but in retrospect, how should we do it? But this was one way. And then there was a second option, which was, if none of these fit, you can draw your own. And that turned out to be really good, and we really recommend it because it's uh, it's a good way to uh, to get a kind of a life story uh, to have a, a terrible thing. But most of them look like this, uh, and it's very difficult to know: is this an episodic course? Is it chronic? There's treatments here. Um, I think this is quite representative. But some of these, there's some treatments. So do they get better from the treatments or not? Is this episodic? Is it not? Um, and this is an example of a timeline. Uh, and each spike represents an exacerbation. And it's been drawn during the interview. And it's, a, it's quite a good way, actually, to, do, to take a history. Uh, but it didn't help us much in, in our research because then since most people said, like, no, none of the pictures fit my story, I want to draw my own, then we ended up with, like, 53 individual of these, and that was uh, very hard to classify. So luckily, we had another method of classification of the episodic course, and this, now, Suzanne has been swearing over these. These are also, they are, this is just the top uh, of them, they're very long. And uh, they are, after interviewing for some hours, it's very difficult because the text is tiny and the boxes are tiny. So this has then been developed into PC, which is much easier to work with. But we uh, looked over the literature of pants and pandas, and then we developed two different kind of scales or instruments, or rather collection of symptoms. One is related to pants criteria, as in obsessions and compulsions, hoarding behaviors, anorexia or restricted eating, etc. Those that we recognize, the psychiatric symptoms that we recognize from the PANS criteria. And one set is, um, uh, is the severe psychiatric symptoms like suicide ideation. And this is also because we had read the papers from the Stanford Clinic uh, which also report a lot of violence and a lot of suicidal behaviors in very young children and other uh, problems that are hard to pick up with a standard psychiatric assessment. Um, and then you can see, so if they never had it, we, ju we just check the box no. But if it was yes, we asked them, okay, so when did this first appear? 
And uh, and then they said, then they could say this was before the onset of what we in this family consider pants, or it was at the onset or after the onset. So that way we get a kind of timeline: which are the first symptoms, and which were developed later. And the same thing with the course. We asked them for each symptom: did you consider this to be in flares, or does it have a more chronic course? Um, and then we also asked if, if, the, if this was a severe symptom. And this is also, this is a clinician uh, rated interview informed instrument. So it's not a self-report. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on the interview and the answers we get, but it's a clinician rating. Um, so, and here we get this kind of a signal. So what we see is that the pants and pandas group they obviously have acute onset because that's a criteria. So um, it's hard to get around that. And that becomes kind of circular because four people in the Örebro group, which was the psychiatric comparison group, had acute onset. And then they were reclassified. But on the other hand, only four out of 36 reported to have an acute onset. So that was uncommon in that group. Um, but that's a that's absolutely a problem of circularity that we have, I think, all of us, that uh, how to classify this is difficult for everyone. What we did see, that the ones that had acute onset and also met other full PANS criteria, not everyone with acute onset met full PANS criteria because maybe they had not, um, well, there are other criteria, maybe they didn't have OCD or takes or eating disorder or some uh, other. Um, but the ones who met Pants criteria. They also had more symptoms at onset. So here I've aggregated, <coughs> it's hard to see, but the white, in, if you look at the A, in the box A, the white uh, bars are um, symptoms that they report to have. That's the, like the, it's just the proportion of symptoms <coughs> reported to be uh, before onset, and then the gray are at onset and then the black are after. And you can see that there's a trend. In the, so the people who, had, who met full PANS criteria reported more symptoms at onset. And at the same time, when we look at them, they also report more of their symptoms to have an episodic course. So a higher proportion of symptoms were reported to have an episodic course. And um, this is what it looks like like when it's not aggravated, when it's symptom by symptom. And here again, the white bars are uh, uh, before, and the gray are at onset, and the black are after onset. And this is the severe symptoms inventory. And I circle the suicide ligations because I think it's interesting that the confirmed pants group, they report suicide ligation at the onset Whereas the never pants, which is the early blue sample, they, it was as common for them to have suicidal ideation, but they report that later in the course of their disorder. Um, so when we ha we also used another instrument, which is the pan scale, and there we got then when using that when we didn't look at what time of the course at, at what time of the disorder they had the symptoms, then we got very similar results because around a third of the patients in all three groups reported lifetime suicidal ideation. So this is a way to say that this, the course is really something that is maybe specific for PANS, but you could also say that this type of course with severe symptoms at the onset is also uh, it comes together with the acute onset and with also episodic course. Um, so that's our conclusions basically, that acute onset was associated with episodic course and with a high symptom load at onset. And that when assessing and diagnosing PANS, you should remember to keep the course and the onset in mind and not only like collect symptoms, like lifetime report of symptoms, and not maybe like combination of symptoms is not the most may not be the most relevant way to do the psychiatric assessment. And then, oh sorry. So, so that's the first part of the talk.
work. And then the other part, I'm going to go through this paper, which we published a few years ago now, which is on the diagnostic value of this blood test. So as I said, the blood test is marketed by Molecular Labs, uh, which is a lab in, in, in Oklahoma and the USA, and it's research driven. Uh, and they have worked on cats and pandas for many years, and are very knowledgeable. Uh, and they have, uh, this panel has been developed, it's been in use for also for many years. And when we started this, we used this as like the inclusion criterion for the study that anyone had taken the test. So it wasn't used in Sweden when we started. And it's also in use in the rest of the world as we talk today. Um, we have talk, uh, Dr. Chang also presented data from the Cunningham panel from a patient who had uh, bipolar disorder earlier today. And it comprises of these five analytes, which are antibodies to dopamine receptors D1 and D2, beta 2 group, lysogam, you see. And then there's an activation of a kinase, which is a cell-based assay, which is also included in the, in the panel. Um, but I should say also that Suzanne and I have not done the panel ourselves. So what we have done is we have ordered the panel commercially as any doctor would. We just fill in the form, we draw the blood. Actually, we haven't done that either. We've gone to a lab and asked them to draw the blood. And then the lab is sent to a lab in Sweden, which is called Vizsla, who then fr freezes it and sends it to the US, where Molecular do all the analysis, and then they send the report back to us. So uh, this whole study is based on like the commercial product or like the clinical product of, uh, uh, of the Cunningham panel. Um, and the idea of the study is to see, okay, so what is the diagnostic value of the panel? So we started with 154 who had taken the panel, and then met everyone wanted to be in the study, and then we met 53, and then we classified them into pants pandas or no pants pandas without knowing what results they had on the panel. So we were blinded to the panel results when we did that, when we made the assessment. And then we see if it match, if it matches. So is the panel, do the panel results indicating pants or pandas status, do they match our clinical assessment? That's the idea. And uh, so I usually show this because it, it, not everyone knows uh, or remembers the statistics course where they went over the rock curve. Do you remember the RSC curve? Hands up if you know it. Others, some at least, yeah. <laughs> So, so this is uh, these are our C curves and receiver operating curves, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're commonly used to evaluate if a diagnostic test matches presence of the true disorder. So the idea is that you need some kind of gold standard, and in our case, we consider our interview to be the gold standard of diagnosis, and then we see if the met test matches, and then. We plot true positive rates, as in the how many are considered like in how, when the test and the assessment match. We plot that against the false positive rate or one minus sensitivity, and then you do that for each possible value that you that you got when you ran your panel and met your people, and then you do a line between the dots. And then the idea is that you want as much space as possible below the line. So. Um, the rock curve that shows high diagnostic accuracy has a lot of the area under the curve. Um, hang on. Um, and when you calculate the area under the curve, you don't want it to be close to 50%, because if it's 50%, that would indicate that the test is just as good as chance as uh, as, as uh, a differentiating between a true and a non-true case. And, and then the, the rock curves that we got when we did our panel looked like this, which was very sad because it's a very bad result. The panel was positive in many of the PANS cases, but it was also positive in many who did not fulfill full PANS criteria. Um, but that, as we saw when Dr. Chang showed this picture. He showed a, a person who had bipolar disorder and was in a manic state who had positive results. 
So what does it measure? Uh, we don't really know at this point, or I don't know. Someone may know, but I don't know. Um, but then when we got these results, we thought, what's, uh, what if our diagnosis was wrong? What's, how do we know? Why is our assessment the gold standard? And, and then we thought we should do it in healthy controls. But they were also positive in the panel. Uh, and uh, and then that could still be there could still be some well the healthy controls eighty five percent of our healthy controls had at least one positive analyte in the panel so that gave us the conclusion that we don't think that this is valuable as a clinical diagnostic test for panzer pandas um, I just want to remind you because I'm showing a new picture and then uh, just to say so we did a final analysis of the result because when we met the patients, we retook the panel to see what was the panel like at the time of assessment. So now I'm going to show you a picture of four groups, and then what I'm comparing in this picture is the healthy control sample, and then the suspected pans, the interview confirmed pans, and then the never suspected pans group, which is the Urbro sample. Uh, and But this is now tested at the time of our assessment. And at the time of our assessment, not everyone who had previously taken the panel were ill. Some were feeling much better. Some had been severely ill, and that's why they took the panel. But then years later, they were better. But these are the results. So, as you can see, there's very little difference between the groups. Uh, I have put the adults are uh, triangles and the children are uh, are circles, but I run the state and there's no difference, like if the sex and the gender don't affect these results. Uh, the only thing that's significant in, in our data set is that um, lysoganglioside and beta tubulin antibodies are a little higher in the healthy control group. So, uh, so in our data set, we, we couldn't get the panel to work. That's the take home message. So, what I learned in these five years, being driven around Sweden by Suzanne and calculating all these data, is that coarse and acute onset and high symptom load at onset may be better specifiers of pants than. than panorama of symptoms because they tend to come together uh, even when you don't have suspected or even when you don't have confirmed pants and that the Cunningham panel was not clinically useful as a diagnostic measure for pants in, in, in our data set. So that's it. And I want to thank to, of course, mostly to all the participants in the study who welcomed us into their homes and who gave us so much of their time and patience. Uh, and then also a special thank you to Suzanne and uh, my other supervisor, Gustav. And this last slide was also prepared by a medical student who is called Almi Klein. And then I have also some other colleagues that we have financial support from various Swedish foundations and the Swedish government. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just a few questions before we uh, finish. Um, isn't, I mean, I understand the result of the Cunningham panel, but is it really no good for anything? Or can you use it in some way? I don't know. I don't think I'm the right person also maybe to answer this question. And I think that um, our data points to with the current cutoffs, probably not. Uh, testing without having some other clinical marker, probably not. And um, I don't know why our healthy controls have sure. elevated levels, but uh, it may be common in the general population, and therefore maybe the diagnostic value is not super good. But if you're looking for some pathophysiological clue, perhaps, but then. Okay, not everybody may come to the same conclusion as you do, but, but uh, you, you would say that it's, it's to throw the money in the, well, wherever in the sea. It's not worth it. Well, we spent a lot of money <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> on this project, 
uh, I calculated when we published the first paper that we spent 20,000 kroner per word. Uh, wow. uh, uh, but uh, um, as a clinical tool, I, I would say probably not, if you ask me. But maybe we will hear differently tomorrow, I don't know. We see, we we'll don't see, know. We'll we see. Know. And I have one more question because I know uh, that there are some person in the room who knows that you made, you took some DNA samples as well. Yes. And did it show anything? Did, uh, which yeah. I can guess the answer because we talked about yes. it. <laughs> but also because there is nothing. In yeah. The, yeah. No, okay. there's nothing in the book. No. no. It's still waiting. We took a lot of samples and we still have a freezer full of sera and uh, uh, everything takes so much time and we need also collaborators so the genetic uh, the genetic materia is also still in the in the freezer. Okay, so there, there, there's, there might come some results out of it but you don't know yet because it's, it's not Exactly. It's, right now it's like a material and a general idea, but we don't have a, we haven't processed that data. Yeah. Okay. So, so we see. We see at the next conference. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eva.